Welcome Boardroom Insight Talk. My name is Sabine Hansen. I'm the founder of She For Her Leadership Consulting. As my guest today, I'm very pleased to welcome Tina Sneels, an experienced board member and um, expert on several non-executive boards and supervisory boards in Sweden, in Belgium and in the Netherlands. Great to have you with us today, Tina. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. And as you know, Sabina, I really support the cause of what she for her is also about. I'd love to see more women get their position in the top of our companies. Oh, that's so lovely of you. And we try our best. So uh, my first question actually goes into that direction. We often hear that a well-balanced board composition is the heartbeat for good corporate governance and, of course, to a major extent also to a high-performance culture within the organization. So, And, of course, the question comes up is how diversity comes into play with respect to that. I believe that uh, people make the business and that mm -hmm. diversity comes um, comes to the forefront in every team. So not just in a boardroom, but I think it's mm -hmm. important in every team composition that you have the right skill set. And so it is a leadership trait to actually find the right team. And you, you find that the group of people need to support both the corporate governance and the responsibilities of a board as well as the, the the fact that they need to support the strategic agenda. Which is actually good uh, to know. Um, however, what we have observed, um, and that comes a little bit um, under, um, supports your, um, your answer, that prior to COVID-19, we saw that the main drivers for board composition seem to me uh, to be the change regulations, like what we have seen in Germany with the gender quota, and that might have also had an impact in some other Western European countries. And of course, if you have a new shareholders in play, like with private equity coming into uh, the boardroom, that has, has also some impact. And of course, in general, uh, what we also could see over the last years, the strong appetite for digitalization competence on board. Uh, following the corporate fail outs um, uh, with companies such as Wirecard, I hear voices saying we need more risk management competence on board. What's your view on this? I think risk management was already there. So I think mm -hmm. the last decade, there's been a lot of focus on, on, on risk management. Um, as with regards to other topics, like you talk about digitization or um, or the case of, of Wirecard, you know, yeah. that falls into, you know, the strategic direction a board needs to take or wants to take. And then they look for experts that can actually bring that. So if you want to increase the speed of digitization, you will look yeah. for experts in that field. If you look at Wirecard, I think it would be interesting to learn, you know, from the Wirecard case, as we always do. And that often triggers uh, triggers some change. But I think, you know, like the banking crisis, um, mm -hmm. um, I believe that it brought about a lot of transparency regulations and then boards had to comply and had to look for um, sometimes investment in the legal department to be able to provide for all that. Um, and then it depends whether you have that representation in the supervisory board or, or more in the, in, the, in the managerial teams in the companies. Yeah. I think specifically in, in the case of, of Wirecard, um, what, what worries me when we see fraud, for example, that mm -hmm. is that um, I believe that sometimes individual gain um, supersedes or becomes more important than the company's well-being. And with the company's well-being, I mean the care for the strategic goal, the long-term existence yeah. of the company, which secures, um, you know, the, the long-term providing of value to society, providing of employment, looking after employees. So so I would say it's not so much risk management that, that I would um, like to see more of in boards because I do not like to increase the administrative burden, which is, which is non-generative. It's not value creating. But I do wish that we would see an increase in ethics and a reduction of ego and an increase in sustainability and responsibility for our world and for companies as a whole 
you know, so so I would wish that we get more of the human values represented in boards rather than administration. Being an executive, right, and, and I've seen a lot about general management and I know how it works and I was part of a management team and now I have the feeling I, I'm the timing is right to secure myself a first board seat, right, either on the supervisory board or on a non-executive uh, director board. So it seems to be, at least from the outside view, that you have to have an access on the wide networks to get nominated. Do you have any tips and techniques to share with us? If you talk about the first board seat, it's not so long ago for me to, to try <laughs> and get my first board seat. So I remember clearly, um, and it was actually quite hard, I would say, that to, to get the first board seat is difficult because, um, not just because of the network, but very often um, they are looking for non-executive experience as a selection mm -hmm. criteria for a non-executive yeah. board. And so um, I would say that um, a network, yes, but, but the network in specific terms to know the recruiters who are recruiting for board positions and to let them know that you are available for non-executive positions is, is very important, especially finding out which recruiters work in the field where you want to um, find a non-executive board position to have an idea, you know, what kind of scope that company should have. Mm -hmm. And then I would recommend not to try and, you know, immediately get a board seat on the biggest, uh, most, you know, renowned, reputed, whatever company, but to accept the smaller mandate first, because the first one will be the hardest, but it's also the door opener to, to a next yeah. uh, mandate. What we see is that a lot of interested first time um, board members that they have participated at courses, how to uh, read a balance sheet correctly, et cetera, et cetera. What are the legal implications? So it seems to me uh, that they are so well prepared. However, once you have secured your board seat, what advice would you give in order to have a real impact right from the first meeting on that board? What would be the best way to approach that? Well, I think I, I agree that preparation is everything. So if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Um, and that is at every stage of this mm -hmm. of this process. You know, it's it's both in getting hired as well as 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 then how do you confirm that you are of value to that board and so mm -hmm. um you have highlighted to reading the balance sheets i would agree you know you gotta you gotta make sure that one of the first things you do is to register on the websites to get all the mailings and the news and the annual reports and 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 search the websites and read that so that you get in the skin under the skin of a company so so for sure you need to know, you know, when you join that there is a, a change in CEO or that the company is issuing new shares or that there is an acquisition brewing or whatever there is going on. Um, you can't find that out in the boardroom. You know, you, you need to be able to to be up to speed with the company. And then um, what what has helped me a number of times is to. Um, ask either, depending on who's in charge, you know, who's the head of the, who's leading the remuneration committee or the chairman of the supervisory board or the chairman of the board or, or the HR director at times, you know, to organize a meet and greet session with key people. So yeah. I really like to know the players in the room before I would enter a board meeting so that the, the practical establishing of a certain connection um, has already been done before you, you have your first board meeting. You're sitting in so many boards uh, in different countries and you have also experienced uh, both systems, the one tier versus the two tier system. So from your perspective, um, what which differences uh, do you see when it comes to effective board work across different countries or let's say across Europe. Now, um, when you talk about countries, I believe that there is a difference in countries, but also mm -hmm. there, you know, if I would compare Germany to the Netherlands, where I've also had in both cases executive roles as well as non-executive roles, I would say Germany is a bit more formal as compared mm -hmm. to the Netherlands, which is also, you know, a reflection of the general culture of the country, sure. right? Yes. So, so I think you find that, but the biggest difference, I would say, is really between companies. And um, 
One big difference that I have found in, in, in my career is driven by the ownership structure. So it is yeah. really, really very different if you work for a 100% stock listed board as compared to a family owned board or a cooperative board or any mixture of the two, which also exists, you know. Um, yeah. So the boardroom culture and the dynamics are very different um, depending on the different ownership structure. So in, in my experience, I dare say that the family owned businesses typically have more of the personal touch of the owner, whereas the stock listed businesses are typically a bit a bit um, tougher on the short term targets where the family owned businesses can be um, really interested in sustaining the company over a longer period of time because they're also concerned about um, their legacy and passing it on to the next generation. So, so there are some really different dynamics in the different ownership structure. And I, I personally find it very, very interesting to observe. Thanks you so much, uh, Tina, for sharing your insights and uh, having uh, a deeper dive with us on the international boardroom work. And good luck with she for her. Thank you.